Well, good morning, everyone. It's 10.30 on Thursday. I'm Chris Thomas of One Accounting. Very good morning to you all. I'm speaking to you live from Edinburgh today, and like a lot of the country, it's, it's pretty snowy here. And one interesting thing I heard on the radio this morning, exactly a year ago today, it was 23 degrees in Scotland. So we're only about 20 degrees uh, colder, as it were. Anyway, we'll move on. Chris Thomas, I'm a director of One Accounting, and just for those of you on the webinar today that don't know much about One Accounting, we work with owner-managed businesses across Scotland, and we help people who have a problem with their business not giving them the life that they actually want. So what we do is actually help them focus on what they think is important, and mainly to help organize their finances as well. The key thing that it gives our clients is that they feel more in control of things, which means that they have more fun and make more money. Today we're going to be talking about VAT, so there's 10 key points here for you to understand the whole process of VAT. So just a few of the things that we're going to be looking at. We're going to cover the history of VAT. Should I actually need to register for VAT if you're a business owner? How to apply the different rates of VAT? And then there's some further things in dealing with EU sales and also some VAT planning tips at the end as well. So firstly, what is VAT? Um, if you stop them, the man in the street or the woman in the street, uh, a lot of people actually struggle to answer this question, but it's a tax on consumption. So you only actually pay VAT when you consume goods or services. And it's a commonly used tax used throughout the world to raise taxes for government. And the whole notion of value-added tax is that VAT is added to goods and services at each stage of the journey, and I'll cover that in a second. So in theory, uh, there's some value, applied, value added at each stage in the sales process. So just to give an example of that, we're just going to have an example here where we have a manufacturer. And this slide just sets out um, the actual flow of money, if you like, um, for a VAT registered business on how it applies VAT to its sale at each stage. So I'll just use my, my little cursor here. So we have a manufacturer, let's say they're selling widgets. So they sell a widget to a wholesaler, the price of a pound, and VAT is added at 20%. That will give us a gross selling price of £1.20. So at this point, the manufacturer will pay 20p over to HMRC. The second stage is that the wholesaler sells that widget onto a retailer, and let's say they charge £1.50 of net price and adds VAT at 20%, which is 30p. When the wholesaler comes to do their VAT return, they will actually reclaim the 20 pence that they've paid over to the wholesaler, which means that in net effect, they are paying a further 10 pence over to HMRC. The third stage is that the, the retailer sells the widget to a member of the public, and let's just say they sell it for a net price of £2.50, add on VAT at 20%, at 50p, giving us a gross selling value of £3. What the retailer will do on their VAT return is reclaim the 30 pence that they've actually paid to the wholesaler for the widget, which means that they have to pay over 20 pence to HMRC. So you'll see there at the bottom, there's a total of VAT, total VAT of 50 pence that's been paid over to the revenue, and that's come from three sources, 20 pence from the manufacturer, 10 pence from the wholesaler, and 20 pence from the retailer. So the theory is here that we're adding value at each stage of the process. A quick example there of what the actual VAT return looks like. Uh, we're going to cover that in more detail in one of the, the steps later on. So a little bit of history for you. Um, those enough old enough will know who this guy is. Um, VAT was first introduced back in 1954. The whole notion of tax on sales has been around for a while, uh, but prior to people using the actual phrase VAT, um, it was known as a purchase tax. So VAT was adopted by the UK in 1973 by this chap who was the Prime Minister of the day called Ted Heath. He was also the Prime Minister that took Great Britain, the United Kingdom, into the Euro as well. And quite interestingly, it's actually the third largest source of tax for the government, so it accounts for about 13 or 14 percent of all tax revenues in the UK. We're currently sitting at 20 percent VAT, but as you can see from this slide, the VAT rate has fluctuated uh, quite significantly over the years. I mean, I would love to go back to the time where we're, we're in the, the late 70s, uh, we had punk rock, and we also had 8% VAT, which would be fantastic. Um, the goods and services that we would all buy would be a lot cheaper. But you can see here, predominantly, really since the, uh, 
the late 70s really, the VAT rate has gone between 15 and 20 percent. If you travel abroad, um, it might be interesting for you to know what the actual VAT rates are in Europe. So the lowest in Europe is 15 percent in Luxembourg and the highest is 27 percent in Hungary. And I've just put down there the VAT rates in some of our EU neighbours, maybe where people go to, to on holiday quite a bit. Um, quite why France has a VAT rate of 19.6% is anyone's guess. I guess that's the French being a little bit different. But I can imagine the, the, the actual VAT calculation of 19.6%, you need to get the calculator out. So quite a complex thing. So you can see there that governments across Europe use VAT really to, uh, it's almost like a tap. You know, they, they know that they can increase the VAT rate and increase the tax going into their their funds. Step three, should I register? Now this is a really common question that we have from people when they start up businesses, whether they should actually register for VAT or not. So the key thing here is it's, it's your responsibility if you're a business owner, not the VAT man. So the VAT man isn't going to come and find you. You need to voluntary, voluntarily register for VAT. So if your sales are above 79,000 a year, then you have to register for VAT, it's compulsory. And sales below 79,000 a year, it's up, to you. It's, up, it's up to you, it's a voluntary process. So why would you actually want to register for VAT if your sales are below that level of, of 79,000? Well, there's many factors that you should probably consider. Um, perception is one thing, so what we found with small business owners if they can actually have on their, um, their documentation that they're VAT registered, it actually implies a certain kudos, if you like. You know, they're a VAT registered business and they would probably be of a certain size. The key thing as well is that when you actually register for VAT, there's a, quite a lot of hoops to jump through and it means that HMRC will actually um, check out the business. So you need to give personal details, you need to disclose whether you've been involved in the business before, you need to give the business bank details of your, your business. So by issuing a VAT number, it means that HMRC have done quite a lot of background checks. So your, your customers, if you like, will probably be, have a lot of comfort that, um, that you've gone through those checks. It implies a certain amount of solidity, I think. Another key thing to think about is whether registering for VAT is actually going to increase or decrease your profits. And what you need to do here is think about actually who your customers are. So if you're customers are mainly members of the public, if you're registered for VAT, then effectively you're going to put up either the selling price to the customer or you're actually going to decrease the actual net sale to you. So for example, if you're VAT registered and you sell something for a pound, if you're not VAT registered, then it means you get to keep all of that pound. But if you are VAT registered, then it means that you've probably got to give around about 16 pence of that pound over to the VAT man. If your customers are mainly businesses, then it's likely that the majority of those will be VAT registered. So actually adding that to your invoices isn't going to matter a great deal because those customers will be reclaiming VAT. If your customers are a mixture, you've really got to do the sums and work out whether it's going to be better for you to be VAT registered or not in terms of what your selling prices mean. What we have found as accountants though is that this is almost an artificial barrier that we see. So if we have, say, a client that's dealing with the general public, but they want to remain below the VAT threshold so that they don't have to either increase their selling prices or give a chunk of their sales away to the, the VAT man, what we find is that they just perpetually stay below that level. So in some cases, a client will you know, just try and stay under the, the VAT threshold for two or three years. They go over it, and what we find is that they then they grow wings and take off, as it were. Their sales increase quite dramatically over and above the 79,000. So it's almost like a, an artificial ceiling has been lifted from their business. So there's a few things to think about there. Step four for you to think about is how VAT is actually calculated on sales. So I've given an example here for a VAT registered business. And let's just say you are a, a consultant. You'd have a standard VAT rate of, of 20%. So the way that to calculate this is that one-sixth of your sales revenue should be declared as VAT. So if you have a selling price, um, actually a consultant is probably not the best thing. Let's just say you are a retail shop selling um, a VATable item. Say you're selling a CD or something, and that CD has a sales price of, of three pounds. The way to calculate the actual VAT on that is to divide the sales price by six, and that gives you VAT of 50p. So in the example that I presented on screen here, 
the net sale to you, to your business, is £2.50. So just remember the rule of one sixth. There's a separate VAT rate called the zero rate, and this applies if you sell a small, there's a small range of goods that are actually zero rated. So I've just listed a few of these down here. So if you're selling children's clothes, uh, what this actually means is if, if you're selling, uh, the clothes that you make are designed to fit under somebody under the age of 14, then they're classified as children's clothes. Cold food, so if you're running a sandwich bar, any fresh sandwiches that you sell over the counter will be zero rated. If you're in the business of supplying print, then the majority of, of print, whether it's, um, I put books and newspapers here, but this could be flyers, for example, they would be zero rated as well. Probably the most complex area that we find <coughs> with VAT is actually VAT on purchases. So VAT on things that your business is buying. So if you're a VAT registered business, then it's very important to make sure that you're correctly reclaiming all of the input VAT that you've paid. Because um, what we found is, again, in our, in our role as accountants where we're either calculating VAT returns for our clients or reviewing them, you don't want to leave money on the table. So we, where we've actually had purchases uh, that you've made on behalf of your, your business and you've paid out VAT, you want to make sure that you've correctly reclaimed all of that VAT. So the key thing is here that you have a VAT invoice from your customer. So what this will set out is the actual goods or services that you purchased and it will specify the net price also the VAT that they've charged you on that sale and it should also include the gross price and their VAT registration number as well. Again, a common thing that we find, particularly with small items, say for example, things that you might buy out of your petty cash, um, is where you don't actually get a, a VAT invoice from your, from your the shop maybe that you buy it from. So let's say for example you need some batteries, you go around to the, the local shop or to Tesco or somewhere and buy a pack of batteries they aren't going to give you an invoice that breaks down the VAT in most circumstances. So if that receipt is less than £250, you can actually calculate the VAT yourself. You need to make sure that the VAT registration number is on the receipt that you've got, but then if you know that it's a standard rated item, you can again apply this rule of dividing it by one-sixth to, to get the VAT. And this is known as a simplified VAT invoice. So again, even the smallest of items, you should make sure that you are reclaiming the VAT. There are various different VAT rates that we see. Um, there are three VAT rates, which is the standard rate at 20%. We have uh, three areas that uh, where the VAT rate is 0%, and we also have a reduced rate of 5%. So let's just run through these. So most of these you're going to see um, if you're a business owner. So a lot of electricity and gas is supplied at 5%. Now, what this means, domestic use, so if, you're, if you've got a flat or a house and you're obviously paying for your utilities, those will be charged to you at 5%. But what we've also seen as well is that some businesses, because they're very low users of gas or electricity, are also charged 5% as well. So it's important to know whether you should reclaim this VAT at 5% or at the standard rate of 20%. A lot of confusion that we see uh, comes across whether the VAT rate is zero, exempt, or outside the scope. So zero rated, generally what this means is, um, is that the government at some point in the future has the ability to actually increase the VAT rate from 0% to say 5% or 20%. So this is important. Uh, typically, zero rated items will include children's clothing, as we've seen, printing that we've discussed, most food and drink for human consumption, although excludes uh, the good stuff like alcohol, anything that's a uh, a luxury product like uh, chocolate or hot takeaway food, those items would be standard rated. Transport, which can cover rail, air, taxi, etc., that will be at zero percent, and also water rates as well. But the key thing is here, under EU rules, the governments can at some point, in, you know, apply a VAT rate. So at the moment, there's nothing to stop the government if they wanted to, for example, putting a, a twenty percent VAT rate on on street parking. Politically, whether they want to do that or not is another question. But that makes it different from the exempt rate, which again is 0%, but this means that it falls completely um, outside of the remit of government to actually 
increase that to say 5%. So typically things that are exempt will be things like insurance, uh, childcare, bank charges, stamps, etc. provided by the Royal Mail, and rent. <clears throat> Rent's a bit of a funny one because what you can do uh, if you rent a property, your landlord can take out what's called an option to tax on the property. So if the landlord wants to, he can register that property for VAT and charge you rent, uh, sorry, charge you VAT on the rent at 20% as well. Um, it's probably quite clear when you actually are either in negotiations with your landlord or if you're responsible for processing the, uh, the rent invoice, whether there's VAT that's been added or not on that. But rent is one of the ones that can, can vary. So if there's no VAT, then it's known as exempt. There are other things as well that which are completely outside the scope of VAT and you don't need to put these on your VAT return. So these can include, for instance, salaries and tax, uh, dividends that are paid to the directors, business rates, and any grants that uh, are paid out as well. And finally, we have the standard rate of 20%, which really applies to everything else, and that applies to goods and services as well. So that's covering out uh, the rules for VAT on, on purchases. Okay, on to the next stage, which is overseas VAT. And to be honest, we could do a whole separate presentation on overseas VAT. So what I'm going to do here is just explain really the, the basic rules, just so you can hopefully get the theory on here. So if you sell goods to the EU from the UK, so this might mean if you're, well, basically if you're exporting things, um, so you need to be responsible for actually making the, the export of the goods. It's not like somebody um, would come into your shop buy one of your products and then leave the country, they would still need to pay whatever the applicable VAT rate is in your shop. But if you export goods to, say, the EU, the key thing here is that you need to check the VAT status of your customer. And by when I, when I say that, you need to ask them whether they're VAT registered, and if they are VAT registered, they need to supply you with their VAT registration number, and this should appear on any sales invoice that you generate for them. So if the customer is actually VAT registered, then you zero rate your sale, so you do not add VAT. If your customer is not VAT registered in their country, then you need to standard rate your sale. And if you're selling to somewhere outside of the EU, for example, Australia, or maybe the United States of America, then you would just zero rate your sale regardless. Okay, services is more complex than that. <clears throat> So services might be if you are an accounting firm or if you're a graphic design firm, maybe with customers overseas, either in the EU or without, outside of the EU. So again, you need to check the VAT status of your customer. If your customer is VAT registered, then they need to account for the VAT under something called the reverse charge scheme. What this means is it's actually the buyer rather than you as the seller that accounts for the VAT. You see this quite regularly, uh, the most common thing is on, on Google AdWords. So Google are based in Ireland, um, so say you're a UK based company buying Google AdWords, Google in Ireland won't add VAT onto their invoice to you, but you need to account for VAT on your VAT return using what's known as the reverse charge scheme. So it's quite a complex area. The reason that this was introduced is really to, to clamp down on, on VAT fraud, because um, what would happen uh, one particular um, method that the, the fraudsters use before this rule was introduced is that they would um, ship, it's usually, usually consumer goods like televisions or microchips, and they would um, add sales, add VAT onto their sale, um, but they wouldn't actually pay that VAT over to HMRC. They would actually effectively steal that VAT. So the reverse charge was introduced to try and clamp down on that type of VAT fraud. If you're selling services to the EU and they're not VAT registered, then you would just standard rate your sale. Step seven, let's actually move on to the VAT return itself. So I've just given you an example there of the, uh, the nine boxes that are on the VAT return. So what you need to do here is just to think sales and purchases. So there's certain amounts, of, certain bits of information on your, your sale that you need to disclose, and also certain bits of information on goods and services that you purchased as well. Um, the actual VAT calculation is quite simple. You add up the VAT that you've charged on your sale, you deduct the VAT that you've paid out on your purchases, and then the balance is the amount that you need to pay over to HMRC on a quarterly basis.
A recent change, when it came in last year, is that all VAT returns now have to be submitted, submitted electronically by the web. Prior to that, you could actually fill in a paper return in pen and ink, pop a check in the post, and that was the job done. We work with a number of software packages. I've listed two there, Zero and Free Agent. They're great online accounting systems. And the beauty of these is that you can actually um, submit the, the VAT return directly from the software. So this is something that Free Agent has had for a while, and Zero have just announced that that functionality is now available as well. And the key thing here is, is that it cuts out the human error. So again, what we found is that um, the client might have prepared the VAT return, say, in Zero, and when they had actually submitted their VAT return, maybe by logging in the system, they made a typing error. So although um, they might have had VAT due, say, of £1,050, they might have entered that into the VAT return as £1,005. So the actual ability to submit the VAT return directly from your accounting software is quite key. It cuts out the human error. Another thing that we see as well is that people sometimes actually forget to pay. So either we as accountants or, or them as the client would submit the VAT return, but for some reason they don't then press the button on the payment to HMRC, they forget to pay, and in some cases you can get a thing called a, a default surcharge. So don't forget to pay. And a good thing to do is just to consider setting up a direct debit for payments. So what this means is, is that you would submit your VAT return online to HMRC, and the payment would automatically come out of your bank account. This will give you an extra three days to pay. So typically, if your VAT return, say, was at the end of March, that was the end of your VAT quarter, you would have until the 7th of May to submit the VAT return and pay the VAT that's due. If you have a direct debit facility, then that money will be taken from your bank account on the 10th of May. So it gives you an extra couple of days, and it means that you've got the guarantee that your VAT is going to be paid. Okay, on to, on to step eight. So this is a planning point to do with the VAT inspections. Now this is uh, normally something that makes a, a business owner break out in a cold sweat. It, they can be random. I mean, there's lots of other myths out there that we hear that, you know, if you're in business, maybe once you can expect a VAT visit once every five years. We've been dealing with clients for, they've been in business for five years and they've had two VAT inspections. And conversely, we've had people that have been in business for say 15 years and never had a visit from the Batman. So it's one of these things that all depends. It can be random, or it can actually be targeted. If there's, if there's fluctuations in your sales and purchases, so say if you're in a, a seasonal, businesses, seasonal business where there's maybe an increase in sales in the summer and then a big decrease in the winter, then that might um, mean that HMRC just want to have a, have a look and understand your business. Likewise, what VAT, <coughs> sorry, what the Batman does is just perform a, a sense check on your figures. So for example, they will always check to make sure that the VAT that you've paid over is 20% of your sales. Now in a lot of cases, it's not exactly 20%. For example, if you run a maybe a sandwich business where you're selling cold sandwiches as well as hot pies, the actual percentage of VAT that you pay over will never be uh, a straight 20%. It will be, you know, it could be a figure of say 12%, and it can just fluctuate according to the mix of zero rated and standard rated sales that you've, you've made. So VAT inspection is always carried out on site at your business premises. It can, if it's particularly complex, then it may be that the VAT inspector will take the, some books and records away back to the VAT office, or he may just come back for a, a further day to, to actually look over the documents. And the whole purpose of the VAT inspection is really not to catch you out, but it's really to check over your accounting system and just to make sure that it's robust and that you've got the good record keeping systems and also perhaps you've got a good software system that helps to record the VAT on your sales and purchases. So it's more of a systems check rather than just to come into your business and try and catch you out on something. Now what we found as well is that the, the VAT inspector will really just look at one or two specific quarters. So they could go back you know, maybe a couple of years and ask for all of the documents relating to that quarter. And there's two approaches that they take. Um, and I put their bank statement to source documents. So it could be that they would look through your bank statement and look at your sales and then say, right, Mr. Business Owner, you have sales of £20,000 on your, your VAT return. And they would look at your bank statements and ask you to produce the, the actual sales documents, sales invoices, etc., that made up that £20,000 of sales that are on both the bank statement and the VAT return. 
What they might do as well is actually look at your source document. Say, for example, they might look at a purchase invoice that you've reclaimed input VAT on, and then they would then look to see how that had actually been paid. So again, this is just to, to guard against um, fictitious purchase invoices or, um, or other methods as well. So there's tried and trust, tested rules that the, the VAT inspector will, will follow just to make sure that the systems are robust. So having well-organized records is absolutely vital from, from this point of view. Another thing that we get asked is really um, how records are kept. So with the advent of scanning and um, online purchases, etc., you, you're actually now able to keep electronic records. So we have some clients that would just scan in, say, all of their purchase invoices, shred the paper, and just keep a, a DVD or maybe store um, the actual scanned image online. That is fine as an actual accounting record. Other business owners just want the security of actually having the paper there. Again, if you're making online purchases, it's quite a, an effort to have to print, down, print out all of the, for example, the email purchase invoices that you've got. Or if you're, you're purchasing things from Amazon for your business to actually purchase, sorry, to print out all the receipts. Again, if you've got an electronic copy of those, then that would suffice. Um, but in all events where you have a VAT inspection, it's probably just important to make sure that you've got access to any scanned or online documents as well. So that was step eight on VAT, on VAT inspections. Okay, step nine is to do the flat rate scheme. Now, this is a, a recent introduction with HMRC. It's probably been around for about five or six years. And it can actually be a way of generating surplus income for your, your business or making a profit from the VAT man. So under the flat rate scheme, you actually pay over a fixed percentage of your VAT inclusive turnover. And the actual percentage that you pay depends on the type of business you're in, what sector you're in. So under this, if you're VAT registered, you would still charge a VAT of 20% on your sales invoice, but you only pay over a fixed percentage. You can only join the flat rate scheme if at the point you join your annual net sales for the last 12 months are less than 150,000, and you must leave the flat rate scheme if your total net sales are above 191,000 in any one year, or that's 230,000 of, of gross sales. So the way that this is recorded is that when you've had your annual accounts um, made up, if, you're, if for the previous 12 months your total net sales have been 100, above 191,000, then you need to leave the flat rate scheme. So here's an example of how that works and how it can actually generate a, a surplus for you. I'll give the example of an IT consultant, and I'll choose the little pointer here. So let's just say in a particular quarter they have sales at 20,000, and the VAT that they charge to their customer on that would be 20% or 4,000, meaning that their gross income is 24,000. In terms of the purchases for the business, let's just say they run quite a tight ship and the total purchases for that quarter of £3,000, on which, say, they paid out £250 of VAT. So the VAT due to the, the VAT man under the standard scheme would be £3,750. Let's just look and see what the calculation would be like if they were on the, the flat rate scheme. So the important thing here is that we would look at the gross sales, including VAT, of £24,000. So that's an important thing to remember. We're not looking at the net sales. It's actually the gross sales, including VAT. As I said on the previous slides, the actual flat rate percentage can vary between sectors. Um, it can range really between 8% and 14.5%. So IT consultants, because they're, generally their purchases are fairly low, the flat rate percentage is, is the highest at 14.5% there. So a percent of 24,000 is 3,480 pounds. And that's the amount of VAT that they would pay over to HMRC. So how does that compare? Well, we've got VAT under the standard scheme of 3750, VAT under the flat rate scheme of 3480. So there's actually a surplus there of 270 pounds. So that is profit that you can make from the VAT man by using the flat rate scheme. It can, of course, work in the opposite direction. So say, for example, this IT consultant, uh, the, the level of purchases increased. Say they decided to rent an office and they had to pay VAT on that rent then their purchases can rise, and so it can go the other way. You can actually make a loss by using the, VAT rate, the flat rate scheme, in which case it would make sense to, to come out. 
So the surplus there, the £270, that is counted as taxable income for the business and appears on the profit and loss account. But for many um, consultancy uh, freelancers, is a, normally we find that the flat rate scheme is particularly advantageous to them. Normal trading businesses, it's a lot harder to actually be able to generate profit or even predict that you're going to make profit from the flat rate scheme, in which case the standard scheme is probably the best one for you. Okay, on to the very last point of, of today's webinar, and this is really uh, a VAT planning tip on common errors. I think it's important just to stress here that a lot of people think VAT is, is fairly simple. You, we're just worried about whether we need to add VAT at 20% or 0%. Or but what we found is that it's the most complex area of tax. It's actually more complex for the business owner and the accountant than, say, income tax or, or corporation tax. So the most common errors really that we see is VAT incorrectly claimed on travel and entertainment. So for example, if you take uh, one of your customers to lunch and that restaurant charges you, you VAT, you can't actually reclaim the VAT. This is because you're buying, um, say, alcohol or hot food and also it counts as a gift because you're actually um, doing something nice for your customer. It's effectively a gift or a piece of entertainment for your customer. So you cannot reclaim the VAT there. However, if you have, say, a staff away day, which involves a meal, uh, you would classify that as employee entertainment, and you can reclaim the VAT on that. So you can reclaim the VAT on the Christmas party, which is always a good thing. Travel and subsistence, say, for example, you one of your employees has to go away, um, let's say, to, to, to London on business, and they would need to pay for a hotel and meals, etc. You can reclaim the VAT on these items because you're away from the normal place of work. Another common error that we see, again applies to VAT on purchases, and it's where VAT has been incorrectly reclaimed when it hasn't actually been recharged. And what we found is that um, this can just be a simple case of pressing the wrong button on your, your accounting software, whether it's Sage or whether it's Zero, is actually just selecting the wrong item. So typical things that we see would be airfares and train fares, business insurance and rates, and also bank charges as well. So again, these items are either zero rated or exempt, so no VAT has been charged in the first place. So there's nothing for you to reclaim. So this is a, a common error that we see. Okay, that's our half an hour up. That brings us to the end of the, the VAT webinar. Hopefully there's been a few points within what you've seen today that uh, has been of use to you. And we've whizzed through things at a fairly quick rate, so just to let you know that this video, this webinar will be available on YouTube in a, a couple of days' time with all the slides, so you can maybe look back, back at it on the particular points that have been relevant to your business. With One Accounting, we're actually running a series of webinars throughout the spring, and the next webinar is in uh, around about a month's time on the 25th of April, and the subject there is understanding your financial statements. So in this webinar, we're going to be looking at the key financial statements that a business has. For example, the profit and loss account, the balance sheet, and the cash flow. What these statements actually mean to you, and really how to read them. So what we're trying to do here is take a, a novice and turn them into a, a financial manager, so they can actually understand and interpret their financial statements. For those of you that are actually in Edinburgh, or even if you're outside of Edinburgh, we're having an event in a few weeks' time, and it's called an Introduction to Zero. So Zero is a fantastic online accounting software package that we're big fans of. We're actually a silver partner with Zero as well. Um, all of our staff here are, are fully conversant with Zero, and we have a number of clients using it as well. We're having a, a presentation here. We've actually got Darren Glanville from from Zero. He's their top guy in Scotland. He's coming along to do a presentation on Zero and also to look at recent developments. So this will be of interest to both Xero users and also those of you that are maybe using another software package or no software package at all and are actually considering uh, the benefits of, of implementing Xero in your business. So we're having this in Edinburgh, fantastic venue at the Botanic Gardens in Inverleith, and that will be on Thursday the 18th of April, kicking off at 9 a.m. And if you're good, we'll, we'll give you a bacon roll as well. Finally, if you like what you've seen today, uh, please do get in touch and ask any questions that you've got, and maybe there's other ways in which we can help you. So there's a number of ways to contact us, either by telephone there, 
by email to info at oneaccounting.co.uk or you can follow us on Twitter and the Twitter handle is at oneaccounting. So it's been a pleasure having you on the call today. This is Chris Thomas of One Accounting signing off and have a good day. Thanks very much.